بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والجنة للموحدين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام الأكملان الأتمان على الركن الأعظم أفضل من تقدم ومن تأخر وعلى آله وأصحابه الغر الميامين يا رب اللهم ارحم ضعفاءنا ويسر أمورنا واختم بالباقيات الصالحات أعمالنا ربي عجز الطبيب فداونا وفسد الزمان فنجنا وضعفت حيلتنا فقونا إلهي حملت نوحا على ذات ألواح ودسر يا ذا العزة والجبروت ورددت ليعقوب بصره بعدما بيضت عيناه يا ذا الملك والملكوت وجمعت بينه وبين ابنه يوسف قبل أن يموت ونجيت موسى في التابوت وحملت يونس في بطن الحوت سبحانك سبحانك أنت الحي الذي لا يموت أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمرا صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to belief and the believer as a form of light, brightness and brilliance and Allah has referred to disbelief, the disbeliever and disobedience as a type of darkness. Can light and darkness be the same? Well, if it was the same, what's the first for load shedding? If light and darkness was the same, it can never be the same, neither literally nor metaphorically. Neither outwardly or figuratively. Am hal tastawil dhulumatu wa nur? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the question, is light and darkness the same? We have understood, and more so currently, the catastrophic implications of apparent darkness. Wallah, we haven't understood the darkness of the heart. The darkness of the heart and the chaos and the mayhem this will bring about is far more than the apparent darkness. And I'm not saying we should not campaign to eradicate that. I was in West Africa a few months ago in Lagos for an Islamic conference. And my lecture was preceded by a panel discussion on Islamic finance. And that part of the world, they're quite advanced on Islamic finance, if you're aware of that. And so while the panel discussion was in progress, there was a power outage. So I was sitting in the front line with fellow speakers and dignitaries and one of the local shuyukh, uh, he just uh, whispered in my ear and he said, sorry, Sheikh, you know, here in West Africa, we have this uh, power outage. But then you're from South Africa, right? Load shedding. I shouldn't be apologizing to you. That's exactly what he said. That's exactly what he said. I shouldn't be apologizing to you. I said, yeah, pretty much. That's the reality. So a believer has light in his life, brightness in his life, his character is luminous, and wherever he goes, he spreads a sense of goodness and brightness. And then Allah says that disbeliever and a life of disobedience is a type of darkness. So sometimes Allah says, كَأَنَّمَا أُغْشِيَتْ وُجُوهُهُمْ قِطْعًا مِّنَ اللَّيْلِ مُظْلِمًا there's so much darkness in their life, it's like a night has enveloped them. Allah says it's like a person who's been misled by the demon and by the devil and he's bewildered in some wild place. I always say, sin can make you look happy, but only obedience will make you feel happy. Sin can make you look happy. So a person living a dark life, 
because of the fake lighting that he puts on, it appears superficially. He looks happy. He looks good. He looks in a good wicket. But internally, he's depressed and he's miserable. When it comes to the apparent light and brightness, you can obtain it anywhere. Buy here, buy there, get solar, get heat like this, get a generator, get an inverter. But when it comes to divine light, Allah says, وَمَن لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورُ فَمَا لَهُ مِن نُورُ The divine light, you can only obtain it by me. There's no other place where a person can get this light other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the dua that the pious will make on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah make us from amongst them. رَبَّنَا أَتْمِمْ لَنَا نُورَنَا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا Oh Allah, complete this light for us. Perfect this light for us. Enhance this light for us. While the munafiqeen will have some form of apparent light and then it will be extinguished. Now, it is part of this iman and this luminous life of a believer that it translates into a life of happiness and bliss. The life of obedience translates into a life of happiness. When I say happiness, it doesn't mean that that individual will not experience difficulties. No, no, he surely will experience difficulties, but his life will be objective, meaningful, and productive. And one of the first manifestations of this divine light is maturity in that individual. And that's the focus of my talk today. A believer who's obedient to Allah, his life will be wholesome, meaningful, and he will be matured, calculated, circumspect, wise, methodical in everything that he does. While a life of sin is a life of naivety, silliness, foolishness, and insanity. So in chapter 3, Juz 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the miracle of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. And Allah says, وَيُكَلِّمُ النَّاسَ فِي الْمَهْدِ وَكَهْلَى That Isa alayhi salam will speak to people from the cradle in a crib in his infancy, and he will also speak to people in his advanced age. وَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And he will be from amongst the noblest of people, and undoubtedly the Anbiya are the purest of Allah's creation. Just reflect over the richness of deduction from one portion of the ayah. So Allah is speaking of the miracle of Isa alayhi salam. Keep focus. Allah says he will speak in his infancy. Understood? That's a miracle. That's amazing. Then Allah says he will speak in his advanced age. Kahla. Beyond the 30 mark. The scholars say why has Allah highlighted speaking in his advanced age? Because everybody speaks at that part of their life. That's not a miracle. That's common, that's regular, that's average, that everybody speaks. But subhanallah, what's the wisdom? And this is mentioned in Bayan al-Quran. The reason for highlighting the point that Sayyidina Isa will speak in his infancy and his advanced age is to impress the point that his speech as an infant will be as calculated as a matured adult speech is. So if a baby prior to the milestone of speaking were to speak, even if he blurts nonsense in some capacity, it's strange, it's unique. It's two months old, he's blurting, he's making words. He doesn't construct a sentence grammatically correct, but in two months, he's not the age to speak. But Allah said, Isa salam will speak as a child and he will speak in his advanced age meaning his speech as an infant will be as coherent and as refined as an adult is. Sadly, we have a scenario where people are in their advanced age and they speak in baby language. Actually, it's an insult. Sometimes the kind of language they hurl 
is worse than what a baby would speak. How condescending, how derogatory, how inflammatory, how, you know, distasteful, how repugnant it is. A believer whose life is obedient, the manifestation of that is in everything of his life, he becomes a very matured person. He's not impulsive, he's not irrational, he's not naive, he's not, uh, you know, hasty. He's a very, very calculated person. The second deduction there, Allah said Sayyidina Isa will speak in his advanced age. And he was raised to the heavens before he reached advanced age. So that portion of the ayah is actually giving an indication to the second arrival of Isa alayhi salam. La ilaha illallah. Dallat al ayah ala nuzul Isa. Because Allah said Isa will speak in his advanced age. And at the age of 33, according to Sa'id bin, Sa'id bin Musayyab rahimahullah, he was uh, elevated and raised to the heavens. That's the age, the preferred age given. So when would advanced age take place? That means when he will come down on the second time. So a believer in his speech is very refined. Ya ayyuhal nabiyyu jahidil kuffara wal munafiqeen waghlud alayhim. Chapter 9, Jews 10, verse 73. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be stern on the munafiqeen. Waghlud. In Qurtubi it is written, sternness here means don't give the munafiqeen leniency in the commands of Allah. Because they claim to say they're Muslims. So in the tenets of the deen, don't give them leniency. Furthermore, Qurtubi, and this is mentioned in Mariful Quran with this whole reference, follow what is written. Qurtubi writes that sternness here has nothing to do with harsh speech. Because Islam does not approve harsh speech in any way with any human whatsoever. Because this is against the preferred character of the Anbiya. Allah says that the Anbiya were never harsh. They were never stern. They were never, you know, hard-hearted in any way. Then Mufti Shafi rahimahullah writes in Mariful Quran, It is sad and unfortunate that harshness of speech is something that Islam does not tolerate with the most rigid and hostile disbeliever, yet many contemporary Muslims will not bat an eyelid to use that language against fellow Muslims. He doesn't end there. Please read it in Mariful Quran. He says, not to mention those who will congratulate themselves for using condescending language against another Muslim as a service to the deen. Do me a favor, go read it. Ya ayyuhan nabi, I'm saying, Isa alayhi salam, as a child, will speak like an adult. Today we've become adults, or we think we're adults. We are learned, or we think we're learned. We are scholars, or we think we're scholars. But this is how we stoop, and this is how we behave. Allama Shabir Ahmad Uthmani says it so amazingly where Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and be stern on the munafiq. He says Allah told the whole ummah be soft. Allah told the whole ummah learn softness. And Nabi Sallallahu was so soft so Allah told him be a bit stern also. Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be a bit stern because of his soft nature. So a believer in every approach of his life, and as I progress and I discuss, inshallah, uh, sin. Sin is a sign of, Allah refers to it as naivety, foolishness, insanity. 
انما التوبه على الله للذين يعملون السوء بجهالا سمى الله ارتكاب ما لا يليق بالعاقل جهالة الله has referred to the indulgence of a crime as an act of ignorance what is the definition of foolish the word ahmaq appears in the hadith of sahih muslim and the linguist then unpack it man ya'malu ma yadurruhu ma'a ilmihi biqubhihi any person who indulges in something knowing very well that this is harm in me this is a fool by that definition every one of us every day when we look in the mirror i'm afraid we're looking at fools Imam Bukhari makes mention of a narration in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad and Imam Ahmad rahmatullah alayhi has also made mention of it that once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a message to Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu and he said khudh alayka thiyabaka wa silahaka thumma atini that take on your clothes and your armor and then come to me fa'ataytuhu he says I attired myself I clad myself I took my uh armor my weapons and i came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fasa'ada fiya an-nadra he then gave me a penetrating glance a strong glance towards me fasa'ada fiya an-nadra thumma ta'ta then he dropped his blessed head down then he said to me o oh, amr bin as inni uridu an ab'athaka ala jaysh i want to dispatch you as the army as the leader of one army Jaishu Sariyati Dhatis Salasil The army of Dhatus Salasil I told you Imam Bukhari has made mention of it In Al-Adab Al-Mufrad Fayusallimuka Allah Wa yughannimuka Wa argabu laka min al-mali raghbatan salihatan And I'm optimistic You'll be victorious in this expedition And Allah will return you safe And Allah will give you handsome booty Allah will give you handsome booty So immediately Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu responded by saying O Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I have not accepted Islam raghbatan fil mal hoping for wealth walakinni aslamtu raghbatan I accepted the deen hoping for reward and the pleasure of Allah So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ni'mal malu salih lil rajul salih Blessed is wealth in the hands of a pious man. The hadith of Musnad Ahmad, لا بأس بالغنى لمن اتق الله عز وجل. There's no harm for wealth if a man fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ذو القرنين travel the east and the west. Allah says, آتيناه من كل شيء سببا. We blessed him with all amenities and resources. حكيم الأمة makes mention in مسائل السلوك under this ayah. فيه دلالة على أن حصول المال حتى الخزائن وحصول الجاه حتى السلطنة لا ينافي الكمال. The ayah indicates the acquisition of wealth to the extent of an empire and the acquisition of prominence to the extent of kingship does not go against the station of nobility and piety. Sayyidna Musa alayhi salatu was salam when he came to Madian and he offered water and he took the flock from the two daughters of Shu'ib alayhi salam And then he sent them off. He assisted them, aided them, empowered them, uh, assisted their vulnerability and sent them off. When they got home early, so the father said, Ma a'jalakuma ya bintayya. You came home very early, oh my daughters. They said, no, there was a very kind man who was very gracious towards us. So the father said, Ma ahsantuma. Well, you know, if somebody has been kind and he's a stranger, at least you can show some form of respect. Uh, appreciation acknowledgement and reciprocation reflect over this amazing deduction that i came across and i just want to share one point and i'll continue on what i was saying so then one of the daughters come to sayyidina musa alayhi salam to say that my father is calling you to compensate you and of course the quran encapsulates her walk uh, profiling her bashfulness فَجَاءَتْهُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَاءَ So one of them came 
almost riding a conveyance of modesty, walking on bashfulness. Inna abi yaduuk. I just read this recently and I was just blown away. La ilaha illallah. Inna abi yaduuk li yajziyak ajr ma saqayt lana. So this is an interaction between a strange woman and a strange man. There is a compelling reason for communication. It's absolutely formal and platonic. The modest line is not being crossed. Reflect over the choice of words from this modest daughter. When inviting the strange man, unknown that soon he will become my spouse and my partner, she said, Inna abi yad'uka asnadati da'wata ila abiha. La ilaha illallah. She didn't say, I am calling you, because I am calling you can be exploited by a lot of imaginary thoughts. My dad is calling you so that any form of unpleasantness could be put to bed. Inna abi yad'uk liyajziyaka ajra ma saqayta lana. وَعَلَّلَتْهَا بِالْجَزَاءِ لِأَلَّا يَبْقَى فِي كَلَامِهَا رَيْبَةً And she said, the reason my dad is calling you is to compensate you for your act of kindness. So she was explicit that I'm an envoy, my dad wants to meet with you, so there's no room. Of course, Musa alayhi salam was the noblest of the noble, but just see the learning advises we get from this interaction and that's the beauty and the practical nature of islam it recognizes and accepts that there is times where we need to communicate but how modest our communication ought to be that's maturity that's maturity then furthermore i don't want to go into all the details when he comes home and then she proposes to her dad, why don't we employ him? Again, there's a reflection here. So she says to her father, Ista'jirhu. Oh my dad, maybe this is a man we want to employ. Now she did not say, this mention in Balagha in Bayanul Quran. She said, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Ista'jirhu, oh my dad, employ this man. The best employee is one who is strong and honest. She did not say, Employ him, he's very honest and he's very strong. Because she avoided a direct compliment to a strange man. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And this was the purest of the pure. I know my vulnerability. You know your vulnerability. If a strange woman were to acknowledge me, or I were to compliment, the lines get blurred. Automatically, the lust overpowers. The modesty is crossed over. And this is the greatest form of praise that a woman could direct to a strange man. Dad, employ him you know why a good person to employ is an honest man and a strong man indicating he has it both subhanallah so when she came to invite sayyidina musa that my dad is calling you and my dad wants to compensate you musa alayhi salam didn't say no 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 you know i don't sell my virtues you know, some people sometimes they fly they fly over Jannat. By the way, you going on, you're going to take it easy, bye. Deen is beautiful. See what's mentioned there. Bayanul Quran, Hakimul Ummah. Inna qabool al iwadi ba'da al amali idha lam yakun al amalu biniyat al iwadi la yunaf al ikhlas. The acceptance of compensation or re remuneration for an act of virtue will not invalidate your sincerity 
when your action was not motivated by that act of return. Inna qabool al the acceptance of a token, of a gesture, of an acknowledgement, of a compensation, of remuneration. Inna qabool al ba'd al amal, after the execution of the action. Ida lam yakun al amalu biniyat al when the action was not motivated by compensation. Musa alayhi salam didn't do it for that. La yunafil ikhlas doesn't go against the station of, of, of sincerity. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam was told, come my dad wants to compensate you. He was like, no, no, no. He went along. May Allah grant us the correct understanding of deen. Deen is not what I think and what you think. So anyway, that's the ikhlas of Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends him. And he is made the Amir and the leader of Dhatu uh, Salasil. After a period of time, the Prophet sallallahu had sent some reinforcement. And who did he send? He sent Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah radiallahu anhu. وَعِنْدَمَا وَصَلَ الْمَدَدُ الَّذِي بَعْثَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم بِقِيَادَةِ أَبِي عُبَيْدَةَ بْنَ الْجَرَّاحِ When the help and the aid and the contingency that the Prophet وسلم, sent through Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah as a reinforcement to the expedition of that was Salasil, a little argument arose in the midst of the campaign. And it was on the verge of getting a bit more unpleasant when Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah radiallahu anhu just nipped it in the bud. Maturity. Maturity, vision, fortitude, rise above, one smarter. So it was the time of Salah. So Arada Abu Ubaidah an yataqaddama. Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu went forward to lead the people in Salah. This narration appears in Al Bidayah wa Nihayah. There is some weakness in the chain of narration. Though it is the hadith and it is mentioned, Ibn Kathir has made mention of it in Al Bidayah, and that's where I've read it. So it's the time of Salah. The leader of the army was Amr ibn al As, the conqueror of Egypt, a great giant companion, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, radiallahu anhu. Each nation prides himself for an honest and a trustworthy person. We pride ourselves with Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah. So now there's a little difference of opinion. Abu Ubaidah wants to lead this congregation. Amr ibn al-As wants to lead radiallahu anhuma. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhuma said, Laysa laka anta ummani. Uh, respectfully, I think I am here and I am leading and I am the uh, Amir of this army and you have come as a reinforcement. So, uh, you know, you cannot lead me. I am in charge and arrangements are in place. You have just come as a reinforcement. So the Muhajirin said, no, anta amiru ashabik wa huwa amiru ashabihi. No, O Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhuma, you are the amir of your group and he is the amir of his group. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhuma said, no, no, I am the accepted amir here and you have come here as a reinforcement. So let's not disrupt arrangements. فَلَمَّا رَأَى أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَةَ الْإِخْتِلَافَ وَكَانَ حَسَنَ الْخُلُقِ لَيِّنَ الطَّبَعِ Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah realized it's becoming sensitive. It's becoming volatile. It's becoming volatile. وَكَانَ حَسَنَ الْخُلُقِ لَيِّنَ الطَّبَعِ He was easy going. He was soft natured. And salute to Amr ibn al-As. He was a great giant legendary companion. رضي الله عنهما he said, Latatma ya Amr, Latatma inna, O Amr, be, be relaxed, be relaxed. We are here in an expedition and we are fighting a common enemy. If we're going to allow disunity in our ranks, we will be fighting amongst ourselves. And the issue happened with regards to the leader in Salah. Latatma inna, 
These are the words of Bidaya. Latatma'inna ya Amr, be relaxed. Walatta'lamanna. And let me give you this comfort. Anna akhira ma'ahida ilayya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an qal, idha qadimta ala sahibik, fatatawa'a, wala takhtalifa. The last words with which the Nabi of Allah left me, he said, when you meet up, then mutually cooperate with each other and don't create disunity in the ranks. And I want to assure you, those words of the Prophet ﷺ will live with me and I will step back and you will lead me in salah and I'm happy to accept you as the Imam. I have quelled this year. This issue has now been resolved and it has been put behind us and we're moving forward. لَقَدْ أَدْرَكَ أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَ أَنَّ أَيَّ إِخْتِلَافٍ بَيْنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي غَزْوَةِ سَرِيَّةِ ذَاتِ السَّلَاسِلِ يُؤَدِّي إِلَى الْفَشْلِ وَمِنْ ثَمَّ تَغَلُّبُ الْعَدُوِّ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلِهَذَا سَارَعَ إِلَى قَطْعِ النِّزَاعِ وَانْضَمَّ جُنْدِيًّا تحت إمرة عمر بن العاص امتثالا لأمر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the vision, the maturity, the fortitude of Abu Ubaida was that if I'm going to allow this to slip any further it's going to become into a full-blown feud between our ranks and then this will be exploited by our enemy and they will thrive and exploit and of course create a gap and a gulf and get an, over, uh, an upper hand over us. Imagine my brother and imagine my sister, you sitting down to wind up the estate of your late father and now there's a discussion here and one asset has come into discussion and already there is now two camps here. No, 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 no. I, I, I know Papa gave this to him. I was there. Okay, do you have a title deed? Do you have a... No, 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 no. I know, I know. No, no, who are you to say? Okay, okay, okay. You can already see the siblings are getting divided here. Either it's going to take some wisdom and maturity to quell, no problem. Boy, perfect. If that's what you feel, Alhamdulillah, I've got no issues. You take the car, it's yours, you give it to your child, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. Unfortunately today, it's this lack of maturity from the so-called intellectuals, from the so-called wise people within our community. Who made up the cabinet of Umar? Who made up the cabinet? Kana al-qurra'u Kana al-qurra'u It were the learned people who formed the cabinet of Umar radiallahu anhu Kuhulan kanu aw shubbana Kuhulan kanu aw shubbana Whether they were young or old it was those that were wise and learned. And wisdom was what you said. In English they say, you are only young ones, but you can be immature indefinitely. You are only young ones, but you are immature, you can be immature indefinitely. We need wise people, we don't need old people. Old age ought to be synonymous to wisdom, not anymore. It was the vision, the fortitude, the maturity of Sayyidina Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah radiallahu that rescued the situation. Imam Bukhari makes mention of the narration. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appoints three leaders, three leaders in the campaign of Muta. Zayd, in qutila Zaydun fa Ja'farun wa in qutila Ja'farun fa Abdullah. First Zayd radiallahu anhu would be the Amir and after Zayd radiallahu anhu uh, would be Ja'far bin Abi Talib and exactly geographically it's in present day Jordan. Zayd radiallahu anhu was assassinated and then Ja'far, the brother of Ali radiallahu anhu, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he became the leader. Ya habbad al-jannatu wa qatirabuha tayyibatan wa baridan sharabuha warrumurumun qaddana azabuha 
kafiratun ba'idatun ansabuha alayya in laqaytuha dhirabuha Today we get every fragrance but the fragrance of Jannah. We get every scent but the scent of Jannah. We get every aroma but the aroma of Jannah. Sahaba would often say, I'm getting the aroma of Jannah. Ya habbad al-jannatu wa qtirabuha, tayyibatan wa baridan sharabuha, wal room room qaddana azabuha. Oh Jannah, how beautiful you are, how splendid you are, how awesome you are, how inviting you are, how wholesome you are. And then Jafar radiallahu anhu passed away. And then Abdullah bin Rawaha radiallahu anhu was made the leader. And then he passed away. Kaab bin Malik radiallahu anhu's poetry is amazing. وَجْدًا عَلَى النَّفَرِ الَّذِينَ تَتَابَعُوا يَوْمًا بِمُوتَهُ وَجْدًا وَجْدًا اَيْ أَسَفًا حُزْنًا I lament, I cry. Over the stalwarts and the giants and the soldiers that fell on the campaign and on the field of Muta. Geographically, like I told you in Jordan, I had the opportunity to visit the, the site of, of Muta a few times, alhamdulillah. فَتَغَيَّرَ الْقَمْرُ الْمُنِيرُ لِفَقْدِهِ وَالشَّمْسُ قَدْ كَسَفَتْ وَكَادَتْ تَأْفِلُ He said, looking at the death of these people, even the sun eclipsed. Even the moon lost its brightness. This is the, the, the kind of caliber of these people that had passed on. When these three Sahaba passed on and the banner fell, Thabit bin Akram bin Tha'laba radiallahu anhu in the expedition went to pick up the banner and the flag. لِأَنَّ سُقُوتَ الرَّايَ مَعْنَاهُ هَزِيمَةُ الْجَيْشِ Because when the banner falls, it means, you know what, the army has been defeated. So he immediately picked up the banner and he said to the people, listen, we've lost our three leaders appointed by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as is in the hadith of Bukhari, which I just quoted to you. So, يَا مَعْشَرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ إِسْطَلِحُوا عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنْكُمْ Please, one of you accept position here. We need leadership here. The Nabi of Allah told us three. Zaid, Jafar, and Abdullah bin Rawaha. And all three have passed on. If our flag is down, these people will think we are defeated. So I've just picked it up. If it was anybody else, hey, I picked it up first. I picked it up. Yeah, first come, first serve. Good luck, tough luck. Vision, maturity. There's a greater cause. It's not me. It's serving the greater ummah. It's rising above. It's not being petty. Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin, istalihu ala rajulim minkum. O Muslims, accept somebody's leadership. So they said, the banner is in your hands, you keep it. He said, no, 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 no. The only reason I picked it up was so that the enemy needs to know we are alive and we are active. We are not done. We have an abandoned mission. So I took the banner and I went to Khalid bin Walid. And I said, خُذِ اللِّوَاءَ يَا أَبَا سُلَيْمَانِ خُذِ اللِّوَاءَ يَا أَبَا سُلَيْمَانِ Can you imagine the strength? You've got three giants that have fallen. The battle is still in progress. And it's the debate of negotiating. And here you have Thabit ibn Akram bin Sa'laba rising to the moment, embracing the banner, going forward to Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid is a Muslim only for three months at this stage. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu is a Muslim for only three months. Khudil liwa ya Abu Sulaiman. Oh Abu Sulaiman, please take the banner and under your leadership will we advance the cause. So Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu says, Wallahi la akhuduhu. Anta ahakku bihi. How can I take it? Anta rajulun laka sinnun. You are older than me. You're a Muslim before me. Fakat shahidta badran. You're a veteran of Badr. Thabit bin Akram radiallahu anhu said, Wallahi ma akhadtuhu illa lak. By Allah, I took it to give it to you. This is maturity. Inna thabitan lam yakun aajizan an qiyadati al-muslimin. Wa huwa mimman hadhara badran. Lakinnahu ra'a min al-zulmi 
ان يتولى عملا وفي المسلمين من هو اجدر منه حتى ولو لم يمض على اسلامه اكثر من ثلاثه اشهر لان الغايه هي السعي لتنفيذ اوامر الله على الوجه الاحسن والطريقه المثلى in terms of capability and efficiency and competency probably sabit bin akram was more capable given the battles he fought given how experienced he was but he knew there was a man who had talent in this field he's a warrior of note notwithstanding the fact that he's a muslim for three months it's an act of injustice for me to seek a platform when we have people with more talent in this field today we are hoarding our platforms people have passed their best before date they've passed their best before date khawfan ala makanatihim al qiyadiyah wa imtiyazatihim al shakhsiyah wa atma'ihim al dunyawiyah but for whatever reasons they clutching on to it maturity is you delegate you appoint you have succession plans because it's not you it's not me it's the deen of allah that will continue it's we are here for a period of time we need to hand over i had a period somebody else needs to come on what what examples can we give to the political world and say how long people are sitting there and the type of autocrats when we look at our very organizations i'm afraid sayyidna zakari alayhi salam made dua to allah the point i'm saying is from the inception of my talk the life of a believer is a life of light it's brightness he spreads light when that man talks it's just luminous it just there's a catalyst it just attracts you it just stimulates you it just motivates you there's maturity this vision the way he comes across the, the, how, how calculated he is there's no naivety childishness or foolishness in him that is part of the teachings of nabuwat sayyidna zakari alayhi salam made dua to allah what was the dua to allah he made he said oh allah bless me with a child right and this is when he was in his advanced age and his wife was of course barren and then allah blessed him and there's something so amazing mentioned here let me share this as well so in ruhul maani it is written hunaka mas'alatan there's two reflections here anna talab al walad la yunafi az zuhd asking allah for children is not against the station of piety because zakar ali salam is the noblest of allah's creation and he said allah give me a child number 2 ان السؤال المسبب من الاسباب البعيده لا ينافي الادب to ask allah for something which apparently logically is remote is not disrespectful because allah has total powers so zakari alayhi salam was over 100 wa qad balaghtu min al kibar itiya i had reached my old age in its most advanced form my wife was my wife is barren and she is old and is asking allah for a child so ruhul maani says we learn from this to ask allah something that logically is not possible is not disrespectful so you know, how can you ask this here there's nothing here it's impossible for you to get this no you can ask wa aqulu fil ula لا سيما اذا كان الغرز ديني لا اله الا الله and to ask allah for children all the more is good great wonderful rewarding when the motivation of the children is so that they can continue the legacy of deen now reflect here zakari alayhi salatu wassalam said oh allah وَإِنِّي خِفْتُ الْمَوَالِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي I look at my cousins here and I don't find anyone capable to take the deen after me. So please give me a child who's noble and pious and I can 
hand him over the amanat, delegate, make him my successor, and he can carry on with this deen. Hakim al Ummah raises an amazing question here. Both these things, asking Allah for a child, first let me mention this, asking Allah for a child when you pass the hundred year mark, outwardly is strange. But in the power of Allah, it's absolutely perfect and easy. Allah's intention is existence. So when Zakaria was asking Allah for something which was logically apparently remote, why did he not then rather ask Allah, these cousins of mine, give them hidayat? These cousins of mine that I don't trust them to take this deen forward, they're not capable, they're not responsible. How many times I've known of people who got empires? The one man said, he said, my son, he will smoke my whole empire to the ground. He said, my other son, he'll gamble it to the ground. Those were his words. So I told him, bye, give it in charity now, then this is your money. Others, when you die, it, is, it, it belongs to others. This is the time that Allah is giving you the chance. So Hakim al Ummah says the reason why he did not ask Allah for the guidance, I mean, he must have continuously asked Allah to guide them, but why did he opt for a successor as a child? Because a person who lived a wayward life, even when he reforms himself and then he stands up, people might still point fingers to say, you know what, your garment is stained. So oh Allah, bless me with a child who's noble from inception. So when he stands up as an ambassador of deen, nobody can tarnish his reputation. And that tells our youth, those of you that are young and early and juvenile and fresh, Allah has given you this good time. Allah has given you this wholesome time. Keep your slate clean. Keep your slate clean pure why taint it why blemish it we've blemished ourselves unfortunately may Allah forgive us inna zakariya kana shaykhan wa kana murshidan falamma raa ma raa taharrakat bihi ghayratun nubuwa fatalaba min rabbihi waladan haqiqiyan yakumu maqamahu fi hidayatin nas so he was a leader and a mentor and part of his mentorship was to transfer this amana on to his successor. So he said, Oh Allah, bless me with a child who's noble, who can continue this legacy. And then with dua bi qaydi tayyiba, dalla ala anna al-istikhlaf min shara'itiha hadhihi sifat la mahdhu kawnihi min dhurriyatihi nasabiyya. The fact that he said, Allah give me pious children means we need pious people to inherit, to embrace, to transmit, to accept and take the legacy forward. May Allah bless us with such successes. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma comes and spends the night by Maimuna radiallahu anha. His aunt, the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sleeping. The young boy, the word ghulam indicates that he was still not at the threshold of puberty. Maturity, maturity. So he says the Nabi of Allah is going to get up to perform nocturnal prayer. Let me arrange water. So he arranges the water and he puts it at the side of the door where the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will relieve himself. So when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finds the water, he uses the water and he says, Man wada al -ma, Who placed the water? So he was told it is Abdullah bin Abbas, the young boy. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for him. Allahumma allimhu al-kitab. Oh Allah, teach him the knowledge of Quran and grant him the understanding. Grant him fiqh. Grant him jurisprudence. Grant him understanding, comprehension. Ibn al-Munir who's one of the great scholars of hadith, 
He says the Nabi of Allah could make any dua for him. Why did the Nabi of Allah make dua for understanding? Allah enhance his understanding. You know, you say, Allah tani hamaj de hamaj, hamaj, hamaj juano, jarak hamaj juano. Ini hamaj bo ochi. You get some type of people that wherever you send them, unfortunately, you know what? Brace yourself for disappointment. Ainama you would jihula ya tibi khair. Ainama you would jihula ya tibi khair. Wherever you direct him, he won't bring good news. Reflect over maturity. Reflect over maturity. Recently I was invited at Madrasatun Noor and may Allah bless the efforts of all. Allahu Akbar. Uh, for the khutm Bukhari, so I was invited as the guest speaker. So my colleague, Manana Zahid Sahib, is a senior ustad there. He was saying to me that you will observe that one of the challenges we have with visually impaired people, that often they are devoid of many basic etiquettes of life. And the reason for that is so much of etiquettes are processed through sight. Now you've got to understand they don't see, so they don't know how to sit. They don't know the posture. They don't know which way to face. They don't know how to appear because all this is processed through the eye. There's so much through the urine. There's so much through the smelling. There's so much through touch. But a great chunk of our etiquettes is processed through vision. So those things which are almost rudimentary, elementary, basic for us, in their case it's absence because they're visually impaired. Now if Allah has given us sight, yet we're not processing it, then Allah is saying, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرِ Is the blind and the sighted the same or not? Surely not, because the sighted has the opportunity to process. So Ibn al-Munir in Fath al-Bari, this is mentioned, he says the reason why the Prophet ﷺ made dua for intelligence and understanding and comprehension to be conferred upon Ibn Abbas because the young boy's action was a reflection of his maturity. He said, in all probability, the young boy processed one of three options. I can either take the water and go into the area where the Prophet of Allah is relieving himself. But then that might be an invasion to his privacy. I might be encroaching on his private space. Or leave it at the door, which he subsequently did. Or just leave him and as he would do daily and leave it to that. He opted for the second one because in that way he will be serving the Prophet of Allah without infringing on his privacy. So the action of this lad was a testimony to his intelligence despite his tender age. So the Prophet of Allah said, O oh Allah, the wisdom and the comprehension and the maturity that he has, double it and multiply it many folds. And that then became the catalyst which propelled him to the height of becoming the unanimous father of tafsir. I always speak about Jabir radiallahu anhu. That when he got married, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Jabir, did you get married to someone young? He said, no, I got married to someone senior. In the words of the Prophet ﷺ, we know, Why not someone young who could sport with you and you could sport with her, who could amuse you and you could amuse her? 
who could entertain you and you could entertain her. And he said, Halaka Abi, I'm addressing my youth out here. Halaka Abi, my dad passed away. Taraka Sab'a Banatin, he left behind seven daughters. Fakarihtu an ajiahunna bimithlihinna. I wanted a young girl. That was my dream. That was my, my fantasy. That was my desire. But I had seven girls in the house, seven sisters. And I didn't want to bring another sister here. And there are eight girls playing together. So I decided to rise above my personal need of a young wife. Because I needed someone to take care of my sisters and my siblings. The ulama write, وَفِيهِ فَضِيلَةٌ لِجَابِرٍ The maturity of Jabir and his virtue, حَيْثُ خَرَجَ لِلْغَزْوَ وَهُوَ عَرُوسِ He participated in the expedition while he was newly wed, number one. Number two, we learn from this year that فِيهِ فَضْلُ جَابِرٍ وَإِثَارُهُ مَصْلِحَتُهُنَّ that he gave preference to the need of his sisters over himself. And we also find in this narration the basis for a woman to serve the extended family of her spouse. I must qualify it, it's not mandatory. It's not obligatory, it's not compulsory, it's meritorious. I always say marriage is not by the book. You know what? You clock in, you clock out. Sometimes you need to go the extra mile for your wife's family. Sometimes she needs to go the extra mile. But leave the story of Jabir. Leave the story of Jabir who opted to get married to a matured woman for the interest of his sisters. We have the youth of today who are so childish and so selfish and so foolish regardless of what their age might actually be that many children today have become obstacles in the subsequent marriages of their parents after one spouse moves on. This is just hogwash. Please make dua when you get married. So I said, Mashallah, brother, go ahead. No, my daughter said, there's no need for you to get married. What? You cannot serve your dad. You don't serve your mom. And when she needs to get married, suddenly you, the children, come in the way to say, Mommy, there's no need for you to get married. When your mom closes the door at night, and it's that loneliness, are you addressing that? That loneliness, for Allah's sake. We initially had an issue where parents were stopping the children, but now the immaturity and naivety has reached such a point. Children are becoming recently, I know the late husband, who was a very good friend of mine, Rahimahullah, and about 15 years later now his wife wants to move on, and on either of the side there's one particular, you know, parent, the children have just created, no, no, we'll boycott, we won't allow this, and this has become a blockage. When I spoke to that person, he says, they don't visit me, they don't do for me. When I want to get married, dad, there's no need for you to get married. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And maybe on this topic, I think I need to also touch on something and I know I'm going to ruffle feathers here but I think it is something that we need to be discussing and that is the extent of zina that is taking place in our society coupled with that the number of sisters that are unmarried we live in, in a time in a society where there's an active campaign to destigmatize every passion, every inclination, and every orientation but polygamy. We're living in a time and a society where there is a passion and a campaign to destigmatize 
every inclination, every orientation. It's my natural, I'm entitled, it's my right, it's intrinsic. But polygamy, leave the rest and the West. Polygamy is stigmatized by the Muslim. Polygamy is stigmatized by the religious Muslim. It's such a taboo that if you talk of it also, it's a taboo. That's our society. I'm not here to advocate or encourage to say, take a second wife. I'm saying to you, if you are in zina, give it up immediately. I'm saying to you, my sister, if your husband is in zina, you have the full right to end that relationship. Islam doesn't expect you to remain in a relationship when your husband is committing zina. You, are, you have your total right to end, to walk out, to end that relation. But if the man is in nikah, then understand the context of deen. Understand the context of deen. People will say, he's done it out of lust. And the immediate answer is, what was the first marriage for? The fact that somebody gets married is a sign that he fears Allah. Whether we fall in short in the full execution of the deen is a separate thing. My point is we need to rise. We need to get smarter. We can't continue in that same old pattern and fashion. If we won't stop the uh, anti-campaign and we won't stop the stigma against it, then what would happen? Wallah, I'm in the house of Allah. Wallah, I'm in the house of Allah. There are so many sisters that message and email. I'm waiting for proposal. Nothing has come. People tell me, no, you know what? You're too dry. You need to market yourself better. How insensitive can people be? You need to market yourself better, man. You're not smart enough. The sister says, she just broke down. And the call just ended because I cried. So we don't embrace the system of polygamy, which is legislated by the teachings of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it. You're not in zina, alhamdulillah. Be happy, be content, be satisfied. But if a person is indulging in forbidden and the haram now, now, sometimes you're in a scenario, sister, okay, what's the issue? No, all I want my husband, he must be honest with me. Okay, brother, be honest. Do you have feelings for the sister? Yes, I do have feelings for her and I want to marry her. No, you cannot do this to me. Don't ever say this. Okay, I don't have feelings for her. I don't want to marry her. Okay, are you speaking the truth? No, I'm not speaking the truth. Don't lie to me. Help me, my brother. Help me. Help me. Don't hurt your first wife. Don't hurt anyone. I'm saying there was haram banking, conventional banking. Alhamdulillah, we have dedicated contemporary jurists that have given us Islamic options that are compliant to the deen. We had institutions that were not palatable for Muslims. Alhamdulillah, in some capacity, we've opened up schools. Zina is happening wholesale. You don't have to find Islam has given you the option. Islam has given you the... You don't have to tailor make any package. We need to rise. We need to come out of our narrow bickering. We need to look with the deeper eye and the matured eye. وَإِنِ امْرَأَةٌ خَافَتْ مِنْ بَعْلِهَا نُشُوزًا أَوْ إِعْرَاضًا فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِمَا إِنْ يُسْلِحَا بَيْنَهُمَا سُلْحًا وَالسُلْحُ خَيْرٌ Love with muhabba. Again, I'm saying, again, I'm saying, you know, our society is such, né? Suleiman Mullah is talking of polygamy. I don't know. No, no, you don't know anything. I got no plans, brother. That, that's how our mentality is. I'm only talking on every level in our community, the desperate need to grow, to evolve, to mature, 
to become smart. Our society, I know of a person who made nikah. Who made nikah. And he said the stigma of society made me feel that zina was better. Our society will make a man look like he became murtad. He became murtad. فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَى فِيهِ أَتَّلَذُّذُ بِالْمَبَاحَاتِ والإكثار منها وانتخاب الطيب منها وأنه ما لم يكن فيه إفراط أو تفريط لا ينافي الزهد وأما الذي يخاف الإفراط أو التفريط فالأسلم له الاقتصار على القدر الضروري منها. If you are limiting yourself to one, you not come. Alhamdulillah, best, great, wonderful. Allah give you all the years of happiness. But if you are indulging in forbidden, then my brother, stay away from this. And my sister, you have the option when your husband is doing the wrong. But if he's doing the right, so our society is, no, he got married, but at least he could tell his wife first. Okay, he come and tell his wife. How can you tell your wife a thing like this, you get him married? Okay, now look at your father. He goes and get married to someone so young. Okay, now I'm so young, he ends up marrying someone that's nearly double my age. Ya Allah, which way? You know, there's a friend of mine, he says, I tell my wife every time I say, my darling, you my Aisha. He said, no. She says, no, 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 I'm not your Aisha. I am your Khadija. I'm your Khadija. So I say, okay, my love, you my Khadija. He said, well, when Khadija was married to Nabi Sassam, he had no other wife. So I told her, yeah, but Khadija had six children. I want more. You said only two. <laughs> Allah give us muhabbat with our partners. I'm saying, let's not think for ourselves only. Let's think of our daughters and our sisters that are sitting alone. There are so many of our daughters that are getting married. And then within weeks and months, we're having to deal with situation where Unfortunately, this man doesn't have an inclination towards a woman. Ya Allah, and a woman's nikah has been performed. Her izzah has been taken. And then a few months later, suddenly this is the discovery or the revelation. And we are still caught up in our personal things. My message is grow up, rise up. It's not me and you, it's a greater cause. It's a greater purpose. We are representing a greater ummah. The Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returns from Jannatul Baqi. I mentioned this often in my talks. I haven't seen a more childish version of adults than quarreling couples. When you see couples quarrel, even children can't be so children. It's unbelievable how childish they become. How silly, how petty, how foolish. There was a brother who had phoned me. Their parents are separated. So he divided the Eid day. So he spent half by one parent, half by the other. The one parent who got the second part of the day was angry that why the first half went to the mother. So the father is complaining. To say that you gave me half, you gave your mother half, but why your mother got the first half? Listen to this hadith, maturity. The Nabi of Allah returns from Jannatul Baqi. And when he comes back, Aisha radiallahu says, Wa ana ajidu suda'an fi ra'si. I had a splitting headache. So I said, Wa ra'sa, wa ra'sa. Oh, my head is paining, my head is paining. So Nabi Sallallahu said, Bal ana wa ra'sa. Aisha, actually not you. You know what a headache I got. You know what a headache I got. And can you imagine for the Nabi of Allah to say he has a headache, knowing how patient and tolerant he was, what that headache must have been. 
Ya Rasulullah, inna ka tu'aku wa'kan shadida. Nabi of Allah looks like you got heavy fever. Yes, inni u'aku kama yu'aku rajulani minkum. I get the same fever that two of yous get. So the Sahabi said, yes, but you get the reward of two of us as well, right, O Nabi of Allah? Nabi Sallallahu said, ajal, spot on, spot on. Listen to the hadith, authentic. Oh, Aisha, I got a headache. Oh, Nabi of Allah, but I have a headache. Now, if it's us, oh, there your mother goes. There your mother goes, right? Yeah. I guess even your back must be paining now. Yeah. Look at Nabi alayhi salatu was salam. Ma dharraki Aisha lo mutti qabli. Oh, man. Ghassaltuki, kaffantuki, sallaytu alayki, dafantuki. Aisha, if it's fatal and it's critical and it's crucial and Allah has decreed that you go, is it not comforting for you? I'm behind you. I will arrange for the burial, for the ghusl, for the kafan. I'll lead your prayer. I'll put you in the grave. I'll cover you. I will be there and I'll pray for you. Aisha radiallahu said, and what else will you do? Read the narration. Nabi Sassam said, well, that's what I'll do. This is the words of the hadith. لَرَجَّعْتَ آخِرَ الْيَوْمِ إِلَىٰ بَيْتِي فَأَعْرَسْتَ فِيهِ بِبَعْضِ نِسَائِكِ I got a feeling you will attend to all the rituals of burial, bury me, perform the prayer over me, then towards the latter part of that same day, Maybe in my house, you'll be intimate with one of your other wives. Salute to my mother Aisha radiallahu anha. Wa fihi bayanu ma tubi'at alayhi nisa'u min al-ghayra. Wa fihi bayanu. Now this is where I need maturity from a man. I asked my sister to be tolerant, to be understanding. You know, my wife says something, and I really appreciate this statement of hers. She says the whole challenge is, Allah has created a man with this desire of multiple women. And the reason for this is, or the proof for this is, that in Jannah, one damsel will have every beauty. So why will Allah reward a man with many? Ask yourself the question, because... The one is not going to be that, you know what, this one's eyes are better, that one's walk is better, that one's features are better, that one's complexion. No, no. One will have everything. So why is Allah going to give a man multiple? Because this is how Allah has designed. So this is his challenge. Then Allah has created us, my wife says, with this sense of pride, protection, obsession, envy, ghayra, and jealousy. If you didn't have that need, there would have been no challenge. If you had that need and we were not envious creatures, there would have been no challenge. But the challenge is the man has the need and women are envious. And this is the challenge that Allah has put us in. This is the challenge that Allah has put us in. And this was the perfect display of that quality in our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. So the Nabi of Allah has got a splitting headache. He comes from Jannatul Baqi. His wife, Aisha radiallahu has a split in headache. The discussion progresses. It gets a bit emotional. It starts featuring about death. The Nabi of Allah ends it on a note. If you go before me, my love, I'm there for you. I comfort you. I'll do everything for you. And Aisha radiallahu says, okay, point taken. What, what else after that? La dhalalta akhira yawmik mu'arrisam bi ba'di nisa'ik. I think before the sun sets, you will be intimate with one of your spouses. What was the maturity of our Habib وسلم, at that time? La ilaha illallah. No human in the annals of history can display this other than Muhammad وسلم. The narration says the reply, the response to this statement of Aisha radiallahu anha. Mark my words, I didn't say provocation, I said statement. We talk with utmost respect. We're talking of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. We're not talking of any ordinary woman. Talk of my wife, your wife, me, you, we can say whatever we want to. 
I said the statement, the sentiments, the utterance of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. What was the response of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? فَتَبَسَّمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَتَبَسَّمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Nabi Sassam smiled. Not psychistic also. Because that's another one. Psychism. No, no, not that psychism one. Nabi Sassam smiled. ثُمَّ بُدِئَ بِوَجِعِهِ And then the pain just started persisting. And it started getting louder. Look at his maturity. At that time, your wife is going through an emotion. Just bear it patiently. I said to one sister who was in a polygamous union, she says, you know, my hope is I really want to be very close to my co-wife. I said, no, 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 no. Bo dayuni banwano. Bo dayuni banwano. In Gujarati, they say, don't become too good. You know me, I want to be so close to my mother-in-law, closer than mother and daughter are. Ambani kashle. Ambani kashle. Just don't have hostility, that's good enough. Don't get too close, keep it relaxed. Keep it relaxed, and inshallah you will sustain it. Don't cross too much, because then you won't be able to sustain it. Don't have enmity. Islam doesn't say you have to be absolutely together. As long as you don't say nasty things, and you don't, uh, you know what, incite each other against each other, that's good. Look at the maturity of the Prophet wasallam. Our mother Aisha said this year, he didn't say anything else. If my wife has to say something to me that you, you know, want to be intimate or you just have that thought, oh, each woman knows her husband and she'll make a comment or a remark, etc. How many of us can be calculated at that time? How many of us can be calculated? And I'm asking both. You know, you find yourself in that situation, my sister. Your husband has another wife. Watch your words. Watch how you behave with that person. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَقَدْ هَمَمْتُ أَنْ أُرْسِلَ إِلَىٰ أَبِي بَكْرٍ وَإِبْنِهِ وَعَعْهَدْ أَنْ يَقُولَ الْقَائِلُونَ أَوْ يَتَمَنَّ الْمُتَمَنُّونَ I have such a good mind of telling Abu Bakr to come here and his son Abdul Rahman also to come here so that I can just uh, appoint Abu Bakr. But it's okay. Allah won't allow anybody else to be appointed but Abu Bakr. These are the words. I have such a good mind, I have such a good mind to call Abu Bakr and his son Abdul Rahman here and then appoint Abu Bakr uh, so that, but it's okay, it's okay. Allah won't allow anybody else but Abu Bakr to be appointed. The scholars say, the Nabi of Allah was contemplating calling Abu Bakr to delegate the position of Khilafah to him. What was the need for him to incorporate the mention of Abu Bakr's son Abdul Rahman? Why? 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 لَقَدْ هَمَمْتُ أَنْ أُرْسِلَ إِلَىٰ أَبِي بَكْرٍ وَإِبْنِهِ Look at this here. لِأَنَّ الْمَقَامَ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Understand maturity. What did Amma Aisha radiallahu anha tell Nabi alayhi salam? After you bury me, perhaps you would want to be intimate with one of your spouses. Nabi alayhi salam smiled. He smiled. This is the nature of a woman. Allah has made her like this. This is her envy. This is her pride. This is her ghayra. This is her decision. This is her obsession. You as a man grow up. Now, why did the Nabi of Allah want to call Abdul Rahman at this time? لِأَنَّ الْمَقَامَ مَقَامُ إِسْتِلَامَةِ قَلْبِ عَائِشَةِ فَكَانَ الْمَعْنَى كَمَا أَنَّ الْأَمْرَ مُفَوَّضٌ إِلَىٰ أَبِيكَ كَذَلِكَ الْإِعْتِمَارُ بِحَضْرَةِ أَخِيكَ فَأَقَارِبُكِ هُمْ أَهْلُ مَشْوَرَةِ The moment was very volatile. 
Because the Nabi of Allah was going and he wanted to win the confidence of his wife Aisha. So the reason of calling Abdul Rahman was to indicate to her, I want to appoint your father and I want to consult with your brother. Your family are those who influence my decisions. Can you imagine what that will do to the confidence and the self-esteem of that woman? <coughs> if it was us and your wife makes a remark, something, let your brother come borrow my car now. Let, let your brother, yeah, yeah. Your father must, must dream for a holiday now. Let me mention one, two incidents and wrap up. Umm Salma radiallahu anha. The hadith is in Bukhari. It's the occasion of Hudaybiyah. Right? And uh, we know the hostility of the disbelievers where they denied the Muslims access for Umrah and they were not allowed to make Umrah. And so the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba, stand up and slaughter your animals and shave your hair and exit from the state of Ihram, Muhsar, the state of Ihram in which you were denied access to the Kaaba. فَلَمْ يَقُمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدْ And nobody stood up because of, of, of uh, anxiety, because of uh, sadness and hope of Umrah. فَدَّخَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم على أم سلمة. The Prophet of Allah took refuge, took shelter, took amnesty by his wife, Umm Salma. The Hadith of Bukhari, he's talking to all his companions. There's an apparent lag. There's an apparent delay. Listen, stand up, shave, slaughter, exit. We're going back. There's no Umrah. And there isn't follow up. So he goes by Umm Salma and he says, oh, Umm Salma, this is what's happening. Look at her maturity. If it was any other person, easily could exploit that. Well, the colors are exposed. Well, Iyadu Billah. See what's the reality. She understood. She appreciated. Look at her vision. Look at her maturity. I'm asking you, my sister, when your husband is coming in your lap and he's falling on your shoulder, do you have that fortitude? He had a long day. He was tired. He was exhausted. There's enormous financial pressure. The children are putting demands. There's other issues going on in his life. When he's coming home, are you taking that burden off? Are you giving him vision? Are you relaxing him or not? <coughs> Umm Salma radiallahu anha said, Atuhibbu dhalik? Is that what you want, O Nabi of Allah? Nabi Sassim said, yes. She said, okay, then exit. And then slaughter your animal. Thumma tad'u haliqa. And then call the person to shave your hair. And once they observe you doing, they'll follow through. And as exactly as she directed the Prophet of Allah, the Nabi of Allah did, and they followed. كيف أخرجت الأمة من القلق والإضطراب بذكائها Through her vision and her maturity, she salvaged such a volatile situation. How often... You're having an issue with your brother or your sibling. And if you go to your spouse or vice versa, that thing gets more ugly, more blown up. It is not by my house, I'm telling you from now. Yeah. I always told you I had an issue with your brother. Now you got a problem with your brother. Good. No. It's blurred. It's obscured. We need vision. We need maturity. We need someone to rise. You see, what, what is Islam calling on? Islam is calling on you. Put yourself in that situation. I say to you, my sister, you might be apprehensive towards a polygamous union. But ask yourself for a situation where there is a widow and there is a divorcee. And see in our community how many sisters are sitting there. <coughs> who are seeking some source of protection 
some sort, source of guardianship responsibility. Ask yourself if this was your situation. Would you, would you still wish other women to be selfish? Or would that reverse your thinking? So Allah says, وَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ وَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ هذا أصل عظيم من باب الأخلاق حيث أنه لا يرضى لغيره ما لا يرضى لنفسه Allah says that if some person has passed away and is left behind children, deal with these children in the same manner as you would have loved society to deal with your children if your eyes closed now. If your eyes close now and you're sitting on your hospital bed and it's going and you say, oh man, my brother's got three houses. Ya Allah, I wish my brother can just give one house to my wife and children. My family's house will be sorted out. My nephew and them, they got this business here. We can take my son in that business. Oh, that will be sorted out here. There's a lift club here. I wish they can just embrace this here. How your mind is running on your deathbed. Let your mind run on behalf of your dead brother. Islam was never about me and us. It, me and, you know, just me. It's about the ummah at large. وَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ضُرِّيَّةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Likewise, we come to the aspect of talaq and the immaturity that is taking place in this regard. It's just unbelievable inconceivable, indescribable at what level talaq is taking place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا تَدْرِي لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يُحْدِثُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ أَمْرَا If you divorce, you don't know what's going to happen thereafter. The hearts could reconnect, the hearts could reconcile. And uh, sometimes just when you think there's no hope, suddenly there is a spark and there is some you know, muhabba uh, um, and connection and rapport. لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمر أي من العزم على الرجعة فلا يمكن التدارك لو تعدى حدود الله بأن أوقع الثلاث الذي نهى عنه وفيه دلالة على أنه لا ينبغي الاستعجال في أمر كان له جوانب وشعوب يحتمل كل منهما مصالح مختلفة that the ayah is teaching us anything that is multi-dimensional. And then the Mufassirin have written, you live in your job, you relocate into another country, you're getting married, you're making some serious decisions which are multi-dimensional. Things like this must never be done impulsive or in haste. <coughs> يَحْتَمِلُ كُلُّ مِنْهُمَا مَصَالِحَ مختلفة. Process yourself. Apply your mind because that's the approach of a believer. He's very smart, he's very wise, he's very calculated, he's very methodical. Now you just blurt three and then you're trying everything in the book to retract, to recall. I didn't mean, I didn't say, I didn't imply, I didn't assume, I didn't insinuate. What was the need of giving three talaqs? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I mentioned in my opening talks and I draw it to a conclusion, May Allah give us this divine light. May Allah rid our country of the darkness that we're going through. May Allah rid our hearts of the darkness. This inner darkness and this internal darkness that causes so much, you know, mayhem in the life of a person that in one place of the Quran Allah says that a person is in so much darkness. That if he was to expose his own hand, he cannot see his hand. That is the level of darkness in his life. Today I met a brother and I graciously invited him and I'm saying it in a generic way. May Allah bless him. He's a lovely brother. He said to me, and this is the reality, I was doing one of my errands and he said, uh, can I speak to you for two minutes? And I said, yes. He said, I'm tired of the life of sin that I'm living. 
And I said, this is the nature of sin. It will frustrate you. It will agonize you. So your mind wants to detach. Your soul wants to wean off. But your addiction is so strong that you simply cannot get off it. And it is this vicious circle that you're just going in and in and in. You need to rise. You need to grow up. You need to be matured. I was doing an interview in Australia. And I said to the brother, also someone who's a revert, mashallah, and works a lot with drug patients. I said, you know, I say to the youth, we all need a push. We need somebody to inspire us. We need somebody to cajole us. But you cannot expect somebody to push you to destination. You know what, please? The car is not starting. Can you push? Yeah, push. Yeah. Yeah, just push me to Fordsburg, please. Come again. I remember when we were small, and believe it or not, it was on the same Nayala Avenue. I remember. There was this guy. He used to get stuck, right? Always his, his gas and petrol was empty, and you know, like he is, you're trying to make a bob here and there, so he said, push you. So we push him, push him, push him. He gets to Shell Garage, he fills one rand petrol. I'm like, you kid me not, man. Are you serious? Are you waiting to, 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 to get stuck again? I cannot push you to destination. Nobody can push me to destination. You can get the jumper cables to boost your dead cell. Your battery needs to generate its own power. Your alternator needs to charge your battery. Your car needs to move. You're a believer. You're an adult. You fear Allah. You live in, in you'll die. You'll go in your own cupboard. You're answerable to your creator. Stand up for yourself. I need to stand up for myself. We can help one another to an extent, but nobody takes us to the destination. Allah told that the Prophet ﷺ cannot do. Muhammad you guide, meaning you show the path. Oh Muhammad ﷺ, chapter 28, you cannot guide, meaning you cannot deliver people to the destination. So grow up. You in your twenties and your father is working to work for you, carrying your burdens, taking care of your liabilities. It's time to relax their burden. It's time for you to lead your family by example. You're the eldest of your siblings, yet unfortunately you're the embarrassment to the family. Grow up my boy. Grow up my sister. Grow up my brother. This ummah is all about maturity and growing up. These were the leaders. This is how they led us. Our deen is maturity. And this is the night. And this is the month. And these are the hours of forgiveness. And how Allah forgives. How Allah forgives. Inna Rabbi Rahimun Wadud. The Nabi said, Oh my people, Allah will not only forgive you after you do wrong and you repent. He promises to forgive and love you. He promises to forgive and love you. Try and reconcile with someone where the relation is gone soured. The best that can happen is the hostility goes. But you can't restore affection. There is that sourness in the atmosphere. It's tensed. Inna Rabbi Rahimu Wadud. Allah will forgive and Allah will love you. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتَنُوا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا فَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمَ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ الْحَرِيقِ Ibn Kathir has made mention of it there. The call of Hassan Basri. Allah speaks of those people who burned the friends of Allah alive. He says, I marvel at the mercy of Allah. These people burned the friends of Allah. Even after burning the friends of Allah, Allah didn't say those who persecuted my friends for them is hell. Allah said those who persecuted my friends, if they don't repent, then there's hell for them. ثُمَّ يَتُوبُ So Allah is inviting us to Tawbah. I'll leave you with this last incident. We've heard it, but just one reflection in this regard. The man who killed 100 people 
And we know he had an addiction. And Allah forgave him. There's an academic objection here. And the academic objection is, Islamically, if you have hurt a human, Allah will not forgive you till that human hasn't forgiven you. We know that you violated, ask the people for forgiveness. Whoever you have hurt or offended, go and apologize to them. So this man killed 100 people, 100 individuals were victims of his murder. And all of them are dead. So he cannot even apologize to them. And they cannot forgive him because they're dead. وَقَدْ يُشْكَلُوا عَلَى تَوْبَةِ الْقَاتِلِ أَنَّهُ إِرْتَكَبَ ذَنْبًا يتعلق بحقوق العباد فكيف يغفر له بدون أن يعفو عنه صاحب الحق وهو مقتول لا يمكن إرضاؤه Now he's dead. He can't forgive you. But the hadith says this man was going to make tawbah and Allah forgave him. So how do we reconcile the pardon of the murderer of 100 people when none of his victims could forgive him or forgave him? This is mentioned in, uh, I read it in Takmil of Fathul Mulhim, but it's also mentioned in Umdatul Qari and it's also mentioned in Fathul Bari. Ajaba anhu al Hafid. Hafid ibn Hajar writes in Fathul Bari, listen to this. How is it that he was forgiven? Addiction of killing and he killed 100 people and all his victims are dead. He never apologized to them. Until you don't apologize, Allah won't, until he don't forgive, Allah won't forgive. بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا قَبِلَ التَّوْبَةَ الْقَاتِلْ تَكَفَّلَ بِرِضَى خَصْمِهِ Hafiz ibn Hajar says, when Allah accepted the sincerity of his repentance, Allah told him, I will suffice with all your victims. Whoever has claims against you, I will satisfy them on your behalf. So I have forgiven you, I have accepted, and I will deal with any claims against you. La ilaha illallah. This is the writing of Hafiz ibn Hajar, and that is the clemency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like imagine telling a person, a, a, credit, a, a creditor tells his debtor, you know what, I've settled your debts, and whoever else has claims can come and claim it from me or for, on, for him. Where would you find someone like this? Where would you find someone? Listen, I have waived, I have waived. Allah Ta'ala says, if you have wealth, then be graceful and give respite and leniency to the debtor. And if you can waive it, all the better. One is you waive the debt off, and one is you take responsibility for all his debts. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant us maturity in everything. In, in, in family matters, in religious matters, in, 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 in all aspects of our life, we adopt a matured. When you sit in, in a, a, an arbitration of an argument or a feud between husband and wife, then it's not representing my child. Sit there as matured adults. Sit there as matured adults, as the grandparents of these grandchildren. Not I'll show you a point and you show me a point. You don't... Hey, hey. You don't know my surname. You don't know where we come from. You don't know how. No, 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 no. Rise above. Huh? Rise above. When, when Zaid bin Su'na was examining the Prophet وسلم, and seeing how tolerant he was, and he came and he grabbed the collar of the Prophet وسلم, and Umar radiallahu said, Ya adu Allah, ataqulu li Rasulillahi ma asma, O foe, O enemy, O adversary, are you blurting to the Prophet of Allah what I'm hearing? Nabi Sallallahu said, Umar, Ana wa huwa kunna ahwaj ila ghayri hadha. You know what, Umar? Neither me nor him needed what you said. We both could do with a different approach. Umar, me and him. So Nabi Sallallahu was owing Zaid money. He was a non-Muslim, he was a rabbi. Then he became a Muslim and he deliberately provoked Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he wanted to examine Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's composure under provocation. So he came out, he studied the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, I just needed to be certain this is the man. And I read that, Yasbuku hilmuhu jahlahu wa la tazidu shiddatul jahli alayhi illa hilma. That the more you anger him, the more calm he becomes. And his forbearance 
surpasses his anger. So he's a very calm person. So he borrowed money. There were two days left. Just before the two days left, he came and he said, Yeah, you children of Abdul Muttalib, you people only know how to procrastinate. You people got a reputation. So Umar radiallahu grabbed him and said, What? Nabi Sassim said, Umar, myself and him could deal with a better approach. You know what you should have done, Umar? You should have told me I must learn to be more prompt in my payments. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And this is a very serious thing. I, I, I want to end now, but since the topic has come up here. When a person reaches a point in his life, and unfortunately we've got a serious problem in our country, where I advise you, you advise someone, but nobody advises me. That man is heading for disaster at the speed like lightning. Regardless of who you are, somebody needs to be telling you. Regardless of how scholarly you are, how erudite you are. Because Sahaba were constantly told by the Nabi of Allah. And the Nabi of Allah was constantly told by Allah. And Allah is the only being that is never told. So if you are a mentor or a scholar or whoever you are, and you're only advising, but you are not receiving advice, that's a recipe for disaster. Then you're going to fragment the summa. Because you don't, you, I, when I pass wind, it, it doesn't give off a bad smell for me. Everything of my own is fine. But if anybody else passes wind, it's bad. Somebody else sneeze also, you know what? Somebody else's mucus running is bad. But I can go to the loo and, you know what, spend half an hour, I won't be offended. So I don't know my stench. But others are going to tell me, hey, listen, you came out of the loo, it was smelling. I won't get the smell. I'm very tolerant to my own. And that's the problem we have. My dad is here, I've said it. The thing I fear the most... The thing I fear the most when my parents are gone, who will tell me? And there are many people to tell, but I don't know if they have my interest or jealousy at heart. But when my parents are here, I know they have my interest. And Alhamdulillah, they tell me I try. I got a lot to learn. I've told my parents a thousand times, please tell me. But when you reach the point, and this is a problem in our country, when you reach a point you only give in, this is disaster. The Quran is coming down on the Nabi of Allah constantly. Oh Nabi of Allah, we rescued you. These people want to do this. They like this here. Wallahu ya'simuka. So Allah is telling his Nabi, how do you reach a point where nobody tells you? Each one of us needs guidance. We need to be told. And if we cannot be told, then we head in towards disaster. We head in towards disaster. I, as much as I'm telling you this year, I got a lot to learn and I know. I've said it the other day. I said the easiest way, if you really want to be frank and open, just ask your wife to tell you some of your weaknesses. Just some. No, but on a serious note, my brother, on a serious note, we have to be told. See the pattern. Sahaba were constantly being told. Nabi Sassim is telling them. Revelation is telling Nabi Sassim. Allah is the absolute. Allah is the ultimate. Allah is absolute. How can any one of us reach a point in our life? To my elderly folks, may Allah bless you. We need your wisdom. But as old as you are, you need somebody to tell you. Either you find people can tell you or you become access <coughs> accessible enough that people can tell you and people can reach out. The other day my papa said it and I mentioned it in my talk now recently in UK. He said it to me and my siblings. He said, my children, 
I'm giving you people this advice. Develop a nature that an onlooker, when he sees you, he finds you to be an accessible person. So if a beggar is walking and he looks at you, he may say, no, I can't approach this man. Don't have a body language that the beggar says, no, this guy I can't talk to. Then he went on to say to us, maybe you can help him, maybe you can't help him. That is according to the moment. But at least your body language gave off you available to listen. So every one of us, and I say this in our marriage arguments as well, you know what, when my wife gives me her mind and I give her my mind, whether we resolve the issue or not, it's, it's a separate issue altogether. But at least somebody challenging my view, that's good, that's healthy to my ego. That's healthy to my ego. وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ We need to learn. There's someone more wise than us. There's someone more matured than us. But if we are only advocating and advising and nobody is telling us, then I'm afraid this is going to be a serious. Then it is going to be إِعْجَابُ كُلِّ ذِي رَأْيٍ بِرَأْيِهِ Every person will become obsessed with his opinion. Obsessed with his opinion. In the books of fiqh, we debate, we discuss. There's view, there's tarjihat, there's rajih. This, this is the preferred opinion. That's the preferred opinion. The scholars, they have this academic debates. They retract, they go back. They say, this was my initial view. They accept. So if we are not accessible and we cannot be told, then this is serious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq to change, to become matured individuals, to become responsible people, to lead with the true qualities of leadership. The Quran says, يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ That they led when they persevered and they had conviction. And Ibn Kathir said, بِالصَّبْرِ وَالْيَقِينِ تَنَالُوا الْإِمَامَةُ فِي الدِّينِ That it is with conviction and perseverance that a person becomes a true leader and a responsible leader in deen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اجعل اجتماعنا هذا اجتماعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا منا ولا معنا شقيا ولا محروما اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا واشرح صدورنا وتولنا بالحسن وزينا بالتقوى واجمع لنا خير الدنيا والآخرة لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم خذ بنواصينا إلى البر والتقوى واجعل الإسلام منتهى رضانا اللهم اجعلنا نخشاك كأننا نراك وأسعدنا بتقواك ومتعنا برؤياك واجمعنا مع نبيك ومصطفاك صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اللهم اجعل نبينا لنا فرطا وحوضه لنا موردا اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من كل شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين